right. Wow. Thank you so much. You can sit down. I didn't even do anything. I didn't even do anything. He just stood up because the pastor said stand up. He's just like, stand up. That's what I actually do for a living. We're going to have some fun, man. This is going to be great. We're going to laugh. This is going to have some fun. We're going to be laughing at church. Some people think you shouldn't laugh in church. My response to that is always, what good father doesn't want to hear his children's laughter in his house? So we actually get to laugh and stuff. And then, so, and if you guys laugh, that'll be awesome. If you don't, it's okay. I already got my check. So it's going to work out just fine. <laughs> Worship was awesome today, by the way. That was some of the best, wow, that was, that was some of the best lip syncing I've seen in a while, man. That stuff was like, whoa. Like the way they just made it seem like it was coming from them. <laughs> that was awesome. No, that was legit. I hadn't heard them songs before. That was good stuff, man. So. So I have a gift for you. I have something cool that I'm going to try to see where I, how I can do this. But I, so there's something really powerful that we're doing, but um, I'm not really teaching on that today. But it's still really powerful, and I want you to get it. So I don't know how to do this without the... Anyway, at some point, I'll probably mention it. If not, at the very end, they're going to put up a code, a QR code, and you can get this. You'll get a video of me teaching this thing that's going to really bless you in a significant way. But this morning... In preparation for this, I didn't feel like that's what I was supposed to talk about. But it's still good, so you should probably get it when they put the QR code up at the very, very end. So have your phone ready. If it's a flip phone, just close it and put it in your pocket. It's not going to work. <laughs> so there's three verses of Scripture that's going to apply to what I'm talking about today, right? Three verses. If you, you don't have to read them right now, but write them down, and then later on when you read them, I think they're going to pop in a different way as a result of what we talk about today. So the three verses is Jeremiah 29, 11. Cool, we got some Jeremiah fans in here. That's great. And then we got um, 2 Romans. I'm just playing. It's not 2 Romans. Oh, yeah, I just needed to think. Jeremiah 29, 11. And then we got John 10, 27, right? You don't have to write down the whole thing. Just write down to John 27. My sheep listen to hear my voice. Cool. And then the last one is Revelations 3, 20. So write those three down. And then tonight when you read them, they put the whole thing up there, this service, that wasn't necessary. But tonight when you read them, I think they'll pop in a new way. So let's jump in. About to laugh a little bit, which is crazy because when I was a kid, laughing at church was illegal. <laughs> you couldn't laugh at church. I remember one time laughing. One time this lady was jumping around and her wig fell off. <laughs> I was seven years old, man. That stuff was awesome. <laughs> then my grandmother would pinch and twist. If I did anything out of hand, she would pinch and, and, and twist. I can understand a pinch. You gonna twist? That's the devil right there. That's the devil. Cool. That's such an unnatural way you're holding your phone right now. Like, you just, like, <laughs> nobody holds their phone like this. Like, nobody. This is, <laughs> this is hilarious. Church was completely different. Like, it couldn't, it just wasn't a cool place at all. This is my experience from a seven-year-old's perspective. I'm going to share with you my experience. I'm going to church, and first of all, my clothes were very uncomfortable. My shoes were like two sizes too small, at least two sizes. And my grandmother had this thing called a shoehorn, which means if your foot don't fit, now it do. <laughs> and church lasts six hours. Then we were going to the basement, eat a sandwich, and come back up. I'm like, what was that, halftime or something? It was miserable, and this dude was up on stage, and for some reason, he was mad at everybody. And I figured he was mad because he had some phlegm caught in his throat, because at the end of every sentence, he would try to get it out. He'd be like, the Lord said, ah. <laughs> act like you ah. I'm like, Grandma, you need to gargle or something. I didn't know what was going on. He had a Bible in his hand. He kept playing like he was going to throw it at people. This is me from a seven-year-old's perspective. He would play like he was going to throw that. People like, Lord, say, ha, ha, and people would get scared. Every time he tried to throw it, they'd get scared. They'd be like, hey, man, hey, man. I realize now they were saying, hey, man. I didn't know. <laughs> I was seven years old. One time I went to church, it was a dead body in the front. Nobody explains to a seven-year-old Michael Jr. It's a funeral. It's not church. I'm thinking, that's how they roll. <laughs> like every few weeks or so, they bring a dead body in. As an example or something, <laughs> the dude on stage would yell at everybody like we did it. I asked my grandma, I was like, Grandma, what happened to the man in the box? What happened to the man in the box? Her whole explanation was, he in a better place. 
I'm like, what kind of box did he live in before? <laughs> it was really, really bad. And even now, some churches you go to, you ever go to a church and they won't let you in while people praying? They be like, you can't go in right now, they're praying. You got, you got to wait, they're praying. You think God going to lose focus? You think, you think God is like, they keep moving, I can't hear them, they keep moving around, I can't. <laughs> 14 years old, instead of forcing me to go to church, my grandmother did something different. She asked me if I wanted to go. But she gave me an option. I was like, let me think this over, Grandma. No. I'm not going to church. That stuff was miserable. Why would I go to church? I just hung out with my friends, and we were broke going up. We had no, we were, I was actually being sponsored by a family from Haiti. Like, <laughs> we didn't have no money. <laughs> That's a funny joke, man. <laughs> Some Christians don't know what to do with that joke. You can't shake your head and laugh. <laughs> When you don't have no money, you get creative. We didn't even know we were poor. Like, my dad never told us. Like, they didn't sit us down and be like, hey, by the way, we're poor. I had to figure it out. This is how I found out we were poor. This is how I realized we were poor, right? I went over to my friend's house, and I thought they were poor because of some of the stuff they had. For example, they had cereal in a box. I was like, <laughs> where your bag at? Y'all broke. <laughs> This, this, it doesn't even spell right. It don't say crunchy captains like it's supposed to. What is Captain Crunch? Y'all broke. <laughs> when you have money, you get creative. I remember I wanted an action figure. So all I wanted was a kid, I wanted this action figure. I turn, um, my birthday comes along, my dad hands me a box. I open it up, it was empty. He said, it's Invisible Man. <laughs> I played with that thing for three weeks, man. Till my brother hid it from me, man. Me and a friend also made a deal that we wouldn't curse anymore. We had a deal right around 14 years old that we wouldn't curse anymore. Here was the deal. If you heard me curse, he could hit me in the chest as hard as he wanted to and vice versa. Dude could hit hard. I stopped cursing immediately. We played other games too. Remember the game Slug Bug? If you're from the East Coast, they call it Punch Bug. Here's how the game works. If you see a Volkswagen Bug, you get to hit your friend. Those are all the instructions. In my neighborhood, they would take this game a little too far. They would add to the game. You ever play Uppercut Fire Truck? What about minivan body slam? You ever play that game? <laughs> There's always one crazy dude in the group who will make up games on the spot, like hit you in the throat tall building. <laughs> you play too much, man. I also noticed at this age, I was struggling with my reading. Now, I knew it before this, but I didn't care. But now I'm noticing girls, and I don't want the girls to know I'm struggling with my reading, but I'm struggling with my reading. I, can't, I couldn't sound words out phonetically. It just didn't work that way. My mind was so... Out of fear, my mind would start to scramble. I would look at the words differently. I would look at the font size, the color, the positioning, what's in front of it, what's behind it, how people responded to it. I actually came up with like seven different ways to look at a word to determine what that word was. Then I got really good at it to the point in high school, people didn't know I wasn't really reading. I was just working it out really, really fast. Now as an adult, I read just fine, but I still have this ability to look at words and people and situations seven different ways almost immediately. In fact, it's the primary place that I pull my comedy from. So that very thing from my past that looked like it was a handicap, it seemed as if I was dealt a bad hand. God didn't cause it, but he's used it in preparation for what he has me to do. It's almost as if I was practicing, even though I didn't know I was practicing. Let me say this again so you can hear what I'm saying. That thing from your past, the fact that you never met your dad before, your parents were divorced, you were raped, God did not cause that but he'll use it in preparation for what he has you to do. Chances are someone needs to hear your story so they can be set free and you can too. You've been practicing. So as a result of my practice, I find funny everywhere. I just do. I'm at the airport the other day. Cool little white kid walks up to me, asked for an autograph. I was like, cool. What's your name, buddy? He said, I'm Tanner. I was like, no, you're not. I see questions differently because of the way I think. People ask questions like, uh, Michael Jr., where are you from originally? Originally, huh. Well, I was conceived in Michigan. Before that, I was with my dad. Um, yeah. Then there's a swim competition, right? And I won, which is crazy, right? Because currently I don't swim at all, man. But 
I used to be fast, man, I was fast. <laughs> you guys were fast too. <laughs> cool, explain that to the kids later. I find, I find funny everywhere, if I don't, I just make it up like this next thing. I met a family from Africa who came to America to adopt a white kid. Her name was Emily. Um, they changed it to Ubuntu. Yeah. And they don't know how to do her hair. It's crazy. You know? It's great. 26 years old, I moved to New York City. The reason I moved to New York City, I hope you're tracking, we're from 7, 14, 26. The reason I moved to New York City is because I'm doing comedy now and I want to know if I can make it. I, like, I want to know if I'm funny. In New York, if you're not funny, the way they let you know is they'll say something like, you're not funny. So there's a comedy club there called the Comic Strip Live, and it's a really hard club to get into. In fact, they have an open mic. They used to have an open mic on Tuesday nights. It started at 7 p.m. Comedians who are new in town, like myself, would start lining up at 6 o'clock in the morning so, so you could do 90 seconds in front of the manager in hopes that he'll call you back the next month and you don't have to wait in line again. So it's really hard to get in this club, and it's finally my turn to perform. And right before I get, on, get ready to get on stage, this comedian named George Wallace walks in. George Wallace is awesome, very established comedian, but the problem is when someone like that walks in, whoever's next gets bumped. I'm next, I know I'm about to get bumped. The manager's already walking over towards me, but no, this is where God shows up for the first time in my life. Well, this is where I noticed him. <laughs> manager walks up to me and says, Michael, listen, George Wallace is here. Do you wanna go on before him or after him? You never get an option, first of all. That never happens. I was like, um, before him, please. So I'm going before George Wallace, and I got New Yorkers laughing. Not only are they laughing, but he comes in and he's laughing as well. After the show, there's a bunch of comedians around him, ask him questions. He leaves them and he walks over to me. And he says, you know what, you're really funny and you're clean. I was like, oh, wow, thanks, man. He said, let me ask you a question. He's like, why don't you curse? I was like, I don't know if, if my grandmother walk in or something. <laughs> my grandmother ain't coming to New York. What was I going to say? My friend might hit me in the chest? I'm a grown man. <laughs> I was like, no, nah, I just, and he said, you know what? You're funny, you're clean. I'd like for you to do a show with me and my best friend in a couple nights. I didn't know who his best friend was. I get to the show, it's me, George Wallace, Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs> so I did two shows. I got two standing ovations. I rip. I'm the man. I'm like, yeah. After the show, the club manager, it's a different club. He walks up to me, he says, Mike, we got a great set. Wow, the crowd really enjoyed it. Hey, let me ask you a question. Would you like to go to church with me tomorrow? <laughs> church, what, what are you, church? What are you talking about? Man, back up, you're making my feet hurt. I don't wanna go to church. <laughs> I'm gonna pause right there for a second because I actually did feel my feet hurt in that moment. So this is a, just a little sidebar as to why you really want to get this QR code at the end. When he asked me to go to church, I did immediately feel my feet hurt. But what it was is I had a negative neural association attached to going to church. So I would feel a pain in my body whenever someone would mention church to me, which by default would keep me away from church. Had I known what I needed to know to investigate that discomfort, I probably would have went to church a lot earlier. But I didn't know the process to dig into that, to find out what it was that's keeping me from that thing that I need. This process is what I refer to as pressing in, and when we send you this QR code, I'm gonna send you a video and show you exactly how to do it. Because you got some conflicts, there's some people in your life, there's some things going on that you don't like, and you're trying to avoid it, as opposed to pressing in and getting free. If some of you guys were here last night, you saw what happened with the lady who tried to insult me last night. The lady she tried, she, she literally tried to, it was so awesome. You don't understand, it was, oh, I can't even get into it right now. It was so awesome. She literally insulted me. She called me stupid from the stage, like she did. And she sounded like a sixth grader when she did it. And there was a reason, because she was hurt when she was in the sixth grade. It was pretty dope. That lady is awesome. I don't know if you're here, but you're awesome. Thanks for that opportunity. Anyway, so I was somewhere before I paused. Which, where was I? Was anybody paying attention? I'm just gonna listen to her. Where? Feet hurt. Yes, thank you so much. My feet hurt. That's not helping me at all. 
So I didn't want to go to church. The dude, want, he asked me to go. I was like, no, nah, I don't want to go to church. Then 20 minutes later, his fiance asked me if I wanted to go. And she was fine. <laughs> Talking about beautiful. She had some kind of accent. She was like, Michael Jr., would you like to go to church with us? I was like, I was just looking for a church the other day, man. Find me a church, man. So I go to this church for the wrong reasons. I can't even find these people, right? And uh, I walk into this church, and there's a bunch of people in this church, and this I'm sitting way in the back, and this dude comes out, and he's talking about Jesus. Just like Pastor Trump, he's just talking about Jesus. He's not screaming. He's not yelling. He don't got no perm. He's just talking about Jesus. <laughs> just like your pastor be breaking it down in a way that you, I can understand. Like, it just blessed me significantly. And then he did this thing where he did an altar call. He said, if you want Jesus in your life, all you have to do is believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, raise your hand, do this prayer, and Jesus is yours. And I wanted to do it. Yo, impact. Scott said, I really, really wanted to do it, but I was like, nah, I got to read the pamphlet first. Because I knew a couple Christians, and they was creepy. There's some creepy Christians out there. If you don't know any creepy Christians, it's you. Yeah. Yeah. Your friends know one. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So I told myself I'd read the Bible before I gave my life over to Jesus. I just, because I didn't know if there was a catch. I, I didn't know what, I didn't know. So I don't even have a Bible. A few days later, this lady randomly at an airport hands me a Bible. We didn't even exchange words. She just handed me this Bible. So I take this Bible, start reading it. First of all, it was huge. I didn't know it was that big. i seen it before, but never opened it. I didn't know the words was that small. So I'm reading the Bible, and I'm going to church. I'm reading, and I'm going to church. At this point, I'm digging into the Word, like I'm digging in. And I get to the part in Matthew where it said Jesus died for me. I didn't know until I was 27 years old that Jesus died for me, until I read it right there in Matthew. I didn't know. I had no idea. Then I turned to Mark, and he died again. I'm like, what in the world? <laughs> then Luke, when I got to John, I'm like, why are you going in the garden, Jesus? Do you know what's going to happen? I wish I wrote that as a joke. That really happened. I thought Jesus died four times. I was like, I don't know why. Didn't I just read this? But now I understand some something. I used to just think I was funny. Now I understand I'm funny for a reason. Like there's purpose behind me having this sense of humor. And it's way more than just me getting laughs from people. There's something I'm called to deliver. And he's also using even the setbacks in my life as well. And I get celebrities, some that you would know who, when we're sitting in a green room or having a conversation somewhere, they'll ask me questions about God. And sometimes the question is like, explain God to me. I can't explain God. And what they're really saying is, how is it I can do all of these things that I'm doing, and people still say that Jesus wants a relationship with me, even though I'm doing all of these things? And this is all I could come up with at the time, because, and this isn't even close to how awesome God is. But I was like, so, it's like being in a car with a navigation device. You ever been in a car with a navigation device before? You ever been in a car before? We can start there. You ever been in a car? <laughs> it's like being in a car with a navigation device. That's how it is with God. Like, if you punch in the coordinates as to where you want to go, and it says go 10 blocks and turn left, then you go 10 blocks and turn right. It doesn't abandon what you're supposed to do. It recalculates what you need to do to get to where you're supposed to be based upon where you are. The only problem is, is if you keep making the wrong turns, the road conditions may be different. They may be rougher, and you're running out of time. So you have to be sensitive to listen to that voice so you can make the right choice about where you're supposed to be. And that voice sounds an awful lot like a coach because you haven't been practicing for nothing. It's game time. So now um, I leave, and I have time for one of two stories. What is your name, pretty lady up front with the dimples? I love, with the, women with dimples, that's so cute. I think the dimples, only in the front. I do want to say that, though, only in the front. So... Um, <laughs> You messing up the camera shot. You messing up. You move. You laughing too much. Your camera this video is gonna be shaky. It's gonna be shaky. So I have time. I got time for one of two stories. First time on a Tonight Show story or um, first time in prison. Your choice. No, no, no. I'm talking to her. Stop. Tonight Show or the prison story, whichever one you want. Don't give any pure pressure. I'm doing a Tonight Show. Whatever. All right. So let me see if I. Okay. So. I leave New York City, 
because I'm broke. I don't got no money. $750 a month for a couch. I ended up being homeless in my car. It's in my book. I wrote a book, by the way, called Funny How Life Works. It's available when you leave here, a book. And then I also wrote a children's book, which is awesome as well. You can get the kids' book, all of that stuff. The proceeds from all of the merch sales that you guys buy afterwards, the proceeds are going to a black family in America. Just want to say that. <laughs> True. So I... It's true. I'm not, I'm not making that up, 100%. Anyway, so, so I leave New York City because I'm hungry and I'm broke and I go to California. And in Los Angeles, there's a comedy club called the, it's called the uh, Comedy and Magic Club. The best club, period. Like, it's the best. It's so hard to get in this club. I couldn't even physically get inside the club. But George Wallace is in town, and he takes me to the Comedy and Magic Club. He can't get me on stage. He can only get me in the club. So I'm in the club and I'm tripping because this is a really nice club. But then he takes me to the green room. And in the green room are some soldiers in comedy. There's Gary Shanley, Jay Leno, and now George Wallace, then me. And I'm tripping. I'm in here. And at the time, these guys were working on a joke about a football player who got hit in the eye with a flag. Some of you guys may remember it. A football player got hit in the eye with a flag and he lost his vision in one eye. Now he's suing the league for $400 million. Well, all of these guys are helping Jay Leno on that subject for a joke for his monologue. I ain't saying nothing. I'm just happy to be sharing french fries with these dudes. <laughs> and the reason I was only eating french fries is even though they had all this big spread of food and I was hungry in so many ways, I didn't feel like I contributed anything at all. So I was just nibbling on a fry. But your gifts will make room for you. So I'm sitting there and they're working on a joke. Then they got quiet and they looked at me and I was like, oh snap, this is an opportunity. I was like, all right, let me see if I got this right. He got hit in the eye with a flag. He lost his vision in one eye, and he's suing the league for $400 million. Um, he's not going to see half of it. <laughs> like, for real. Here's the thing. How did I get that joke that fast under that much pressure? The truth is, it wasn't as much pressure as you might think, because I've been practicing since I was a child in the form of a kid who was struggling with his reading, and other things as well. I was practicing just like you've been practicing. Maybe you didn't know you were practicing. I'm here right now today to let you know you've been practicing. And for a lot of you guys, it is game time. But you have to be able to hear the coach's voice. I'm going to squeeze this other story in because you asked for it. First time ever going. So I have a nonprofit called Funny for the Forgotten, where we go to homeless shelters and prisons and all these places and take comedy there. But even before I started this nonprofit, my first time ever in prison, I'm walking into this prison and I'm scared for real. As soon as I walk in, the warden takes my belt. He's like, you can't have a belt. Somebody might try to hang you. <laughs> can't they just boo me like regular people would? <laughs> That's why they're in prison. I'm scared for real. Like, I'm in prison, my pants loose. This is a bad idea, man. <laughs> I got seven different ways to look at this, man. <laughs> so I'm scared for real. I, and I'm walking in, and the bar is open in front of you, and some clothes, and they open it. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Welcome home. Anyway, <laughs> I'm walking in this prison, and I'm scared. I'm like, listen, for real, I'm scared. And I got a bunch of guards around me, though, so I'm cool. I'm walking in, but slowly but surely, the guards start peeling off. To this, the final doors, it's me and one dude. He's like, hey, man, this is as far as I go. I was like, well, me too. Send him a DVD. <laughs> I'm going to drop a DVD off or something. So I'm scared for real. And the dude gave me a little black box with a pin on it. He said he put it on my, in my pocket right here. He said, if anyone tries to attack you, just pull the pin out of the box. And then we'll come in and help. That's the plan? <laughs> you gave me a black box like on an airplane? That's what you gave me? A... Them dudes in the prison, they know about the pin. One dude, his job is to keep the pin in. Like... Not only am I afraid, but I also don't have a joke. I go in here, there's all these prisoners, they're all in this big circle, and there's an opening in the middle of the circle, and I gotta walk my way in the middle and do jokes. And I got nothing. Nothing's popping up. Seven different ways to nothing. You can't tell on the outside I look really cool, but I don't got nothing. I'm walking in, nothing is like nothing. I had one joke pop up, but I didn't feel like I should start with it. I was gonna be like, you know what? You guys are a captive audience. I just want to say that, you know. Um, I didn't feel a piece in my spirit about that joke. So I'm walking in, and I'm scared. I'm walking in. I got like three steps left before I hit the middle. And if I don't say anything, they're going to know I got nothing. Then I don't know what's going to happen. Two steps left. 
One step left. I lift his foot up. Nothing, nothing, nothing. I settled his foot. And for real, impact. Sitting right up front is a white dude with a white beard named Moses. I was like, thanks, Lord. <laughs> when I said these words, the place exploded in laughter. We had an amazing time. I said, Moses, this is what I want you to do. When you see the prison warden, I want you to look him in his eye. I want you to look him right in his eye, and I want you to say, let my people go. <laughs> For real. How did I get that joke that fast under that much pressure? I was practicing. Just like you've been practicing. Your practice looks different than mine. Some of you guys have been practicing through this pandemic, but it's, it can't go to waste. You've been prepared. You just have to be able to hear the coach's voice. So me and my wife were looking at some old home videos recently. It wasn't super old. It wasn't like a, a VHS or something. <laughs> some of the kids looking at me like, what's of a hush? So we're looking at some old home videos. We came across this video of our youngest daughter being born. It's not her being born, because I'm not going to show you that video, because that'd be weird. <laughs> we came across this video, and when I saw this video, I, I'm the one who took this video, but I didn't understand the impact of what I'm about to show you until I watched the video. So let me set it up for you. Our daughter is, at the time, she's like two and a half minutes old, and, the, um, and they got her under that little chicken warmer, the little thing that keeps it... <laughs> A little french fry. Well, I don't know what kind of insurance we have, but that's what they had her under. <laughs> She's two and a half minutes old, and the nurse is about to clean her up, and she starts to cry. I want you to notice what happens when she hears my voice. It's okay, Portland. Look, I'm right here. It's okay. It's okay. I'm right here. I'm right here. We're doing just fine. It's okay. It's okay. I'm right here. Right here. Yeah. It's okay. It's okay, baby. Yo, that was pretty awesome. Now, now it's like seven minutes or so later. The nurse is done cleaning her up. Maybe seven and a half minutes. The nurse is done cleaning her up, and she starts to cry again. I speak up, and she stops crying again. But I want you to notice what happens when I tell her I love her. Portland, it's okay. It's okay, it's good, it's good, it's good. I'm right here, I'm right here. I am right here. I love you, I love you, I love you. Yeah, I'm right here, I'm right here. It's okay, it's okay. Yo, that was pretty awesome. Now listen, there's going to be times in life there will be times in life where you feel like you've just been practicing and practicing and practicing. Maybe even to the point of tears. The key thing to do in those moments is to be still and listen for the Father's voice. Because he is talking to you. And what he wants you to know is that he's right here. He loves you. All you have to do is open your eyes. You hear some music? Yeah, not yet, man. Wait, it's not your concert. Not yet. Not yet. You get me. <laughs> you get me all emotional. I'm like, is that you, Lord? What is that? Man? That's these brothers right here trying to. Oh man, goodness. I'm like, Lord, that's that's music to my heart right now. Nope, nope, it's y'all. Okay. Y'all got one more story I need to tell before y'all zoom on in there. It's just all smooth and stuff. That was smooth, bro. You married? Yeah, you are. I can tell because you smooth. You, Okay, so I got one more story I need to tell, and then after I'm, but first I want to tell you how I came up with the story. After I tell you how I came up with the story, at that point, this smooth dude's supposed to slide in. <laughs> so the story I want to share with you is a story about having a relationship with Jesus. But the way I came up with this story is I was writing a joke. I was just doing what I do. I was writing this joke about the good room. How many people here know what the good room is? Raise your hand. Or anybody watching online, how many people know what the good room is? See, there's no hands going up. The truth is, you don't know what it is because I never finished writing a joke, but you actually do know what the good room is. Let me explain. The good room is that room in your grandmother's house or your aunt's house or maybe your house. It's that one room that's better than the rest of the house. Can't nobody go in there. It's plastic on the furniture. It's really just for looks. You can't go in the good room. How many people know what the good room is now? Raise your hand. Exactly. 
So I'm writing this joke about the good room, and in the middle of writing this joke, God stops me and tells me to tell this story instead of writing a joke. So I'm going to tell you the story. Right now would be a great time to slide in there, bro. You're going to be <laughs> you early and late. Man, you're amazing. It's amazing. So I want everyone in here right now, even those watching online, this is a story about having a relationship with Jesus, right? So I want you to imagine, imagine that you are a house and outside of the house is Jesus Christ and he wants to come in, but he'll never force his way in. He wants you to invite him in. And the reason some people in this room, even watching online right now, the reason you haven't invited Jesus into the house or all the way into the house is because you're cool with the way things are right now. So it would seem. Whenever you need something, you walk up to the door, crack it open, tell them what happened, say a little prayer, close the door, and then go back into the house and do whatever you're doing. But that's not a relationship at all. How can you hear his voice under those circumstances? How can you truly utilize this practice under those circumstances? And the reason you won't let him into the house is because your house is a mess. You think you need to clean it up first. Just tidy it up a little more first. How's that working out for you? There may be drugs or pornography in the house, or maybe you just volunteer and stand extra busy buying a bunch of stuff so you can be distracted from the mess. Or relationships, you brought other people in the house, hoping that somehow they could help you clean it up, feel better, but they can't. The only one who can clean it up is standing outside the door wearing an apron with a bucket in his hand, waiting on you to truly open the door. Then there's other people in here right now. You used to have Jesus in the whole house. But whether you realize it or not, you've moved him to just one room in the house, the good room. Have you ever noticed how the good room most of the time is the one right up front with the big window? So when people look in, they think the whole house is clean. But it's not. It's just that one room. So when they hear about you coming to church, they think the whole house is clean. But it's not. You know it's not. It's just that one room. You quote scriptures, but it's just that one room. You got a tattoo on your arm of Bible scripture, but it's just that one room. You give money, but it's just that one room. Jesus wants access to the whole house. And I'm telling you, if you would just open this door and let him in, he'll show up with a contractor named the Holy Spirit. And they will make sure the house is fully functioning the way it was intended to. But none of this happens if you don't open the door. Because he will not. He will never force his way in. He wants you to invite him in. So if everyone in here, if you could just close your eyes and bow your head. The reason I ask you to do this is so you can have a private moment where no one's looking around. If you're in here right now and you know that you need to invite Jesus into your house, whether it be for the first time or to truly give him full access to the house. Truly full access to the house. I'm gonna actually do something really, really simple. On the count of three, I just simply want you to put your hand in the air. Don't overthink this. Just if that's you, just simply put your hand in the air. Hands are already going up. One, two, three, nice and hot. Praise God, praise God. Go ahead and put your hands down and then look up at me. First of all, let me say, I am proud of you. Now listen, I'm going to repeat that phrase a certain number of times. I feel like God always gives me a number of how many times I need to repeat that phrase so some people in the room can receive it from a father's voice. Some of you have never heard that from a father's voice. Some of you have never received it from a father's voice. So I'm going to say that phrase again and I simply want you to work on receiving it from a father's voice. And this is not just for those who raise their hand. I'm proud of you. I am 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 proud of you. Now I'm asking you to do something else, and this is for everyone who raised their hand, and even those who should have raised their hand. Jesus says, if you would take a stand for me before man, I will take a stand for you before my Father in the heaven. So that's going to look like right here on earth, right here at Impact Church. 
is all of those who raised their hand, even those who should have raised their hand, on a count of three, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet and remain standing. When you raised your hand, it was as if you were reaching for the doorknob. But when I count to three and you stand up and remain standing and we do this prayer together, it's like you're blowing a door open so Jesus can come into the house. If you can't stand in here where we're proud of you, you won't be able to stand out there. So again, this is for everyone who raised their hand. And even those who should have raised their hand, on the count of three, I want you to stand up and remain standing. And to help with that, everyone around you, they're going to applaud as loud as they can. But it will not compare to the applause that the angels in heaven will be doing when you stand to your feet and remain standing. One, two, three. Just stand up and remain standing. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. If you're standing up, don't clap. If you're standing, don't clap. Let just receive the applause of the people around you. Just simply receive the applause. Those applause are saying, I'm proud of you. 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 Okay. No, no, no. Keep standing. Keep standing. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a prayer. See, the tendency is after the applause of men stop is to sit back down. This don't got nothing to do with them. This is completely about you and him. It's not a horizontal thing at all. It's vertical. Cool, your camera shot just got messed up because you had to stand up. But you held on, didn't you? You held on. She was like, I'm going to keep on recording this whole time. <laughs> so here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a prayer. And you'll be different on the inside. A metamorphosis will start to form on the inside. The outside, you'll look the same. But what you have to do, if you don't have a church home, this church is dope. Just but if, if you're from someplace else, you just came here, you've got to find some, some Christians who can come alongside you. Because right now, what it is, is you're like a tree. You ever see a small tree when it's planted or whatever, and then they always got those little steel bars with a little thing tied to the tree? Well, those little steel bars are like other Christians who will come alongside you. Because the wind will come. It'll blow. And you don't want the wind to blow in such a way where you grow angry or you grow bitter, or you grow mad. You want to grow up towards God so you can bear the fruit you're supposed to bear so the people around you can enjoy your fruit. So we're going to do a prayer together, and then they normally bring up a white dude to make it official. I don't know if they're going <laughs> to normally do that part. <laughs> there he is lurking. There he is. So we're going to do this prayer. There's three people in this room who are sitting down who should be standing. You know who you are. This is how you always do. This is your opportunity. I know, you're like, there's a lot of people standing where I got, no, 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 you know who you are. There's three people who are sitting down who should be standing. So this is your opportunity. All right, repeat after me, nice and loud, bold and clear. Man, thank you for letting me be a part of this. Goodness gracious, thank you. So we're gonna pray, repeat after me. In fact, just pray this prayer in the privacy of your heart. I'll say the prayer and you repeat it in the privacy of your heart. Dear God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to die for me. I believe it, Lord, and I receive it. Thank you that he rose again on the third day and died for all my sins. Have your way in my life, Father. Come into my house and come into my heart and have your way, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, you guys are awesome.